This is the Kickstarter iceberg. This iceberg chart outlines the worst ideas and the biggest scams that Kickstarter has ever seen. So in case you don't know what Kickstarter is, I'll give you just a speed run explanation. Kickstarter is a crowdfunding website where if you have a brilliant idea for a product that you want to make a reality, you can go onto Kickstarter and make a web page where you pitch this product. And if people like what you're pitching, they can decide to give you money in the hopes that you can make this product a reality. Now, quite a few pretty good products have come from Kickstarter over the years. Oculus's first VR headset, the Oculus Rift, actually started as a Kickstarter campaign. Undertale and Shovel Knight were both games that started as Kickstarter campaigns. That Exploding Kittens game, if you've ever seen that around, that started as a Kickstarter campaign. Good things do come from this website, but definitely not everything. Before we get into this, I need to quickly point out some things. First of all, some of the entries on this iceberg chart are actually Indiegogo projects. Kickstarter and Indiegogo provide a very similar service. They're both crowdfunding websites where you make a web page that pitches your product and then people can decide whether or not they want to fund it. They both offer rewards for people who decide to back products. Since both of these websites are basically the same thing, this iceberg chart covers stuff from both of them. Also, I want to keep a pretty decent pace going through all of these entries here today. And so I am going to go a little bit in depth into some of these entries that are worth it, but I'm also just going to breeze through a lot of these. All right, let's get into it. The Triton Gills. So in 2016, an Indiegogo campaign was launched for something called the Triton Gills. Now this product made some pretty bold claims on what it was apparently capable of. The Triton Gills were apparently an electronic you could hold in your mouth that would allow you to breathe underwater. The original Indiegogo campaign for the Triton Gills made no mention of any air tanks. Instead, the campaign mentions that the Triton Gills would use a microfiber substance that would literally filter oxygen out of the water so you could breathe it. Now, this Kickstarter page did feature a pitch video for the Triton Gills, and within this pitch video, there is supposedly footage of the Triton Gills actually operating in a pool. But if you just take a moment to really consider what's going on in this video, it becomes pretty clear that this is fake. First of all, the video of him using the Triton Gills cuts at about 30 seconds in, and most people can just hold their breath for 30 seconds. From the looks of it, there might have also been another video that was up that showed this guy using the Triton Gills for 47 seconds underwater. But even if he did 47 seconds in this now unavailable video, most healthy people can hold their breath underwater for 47 seconds anyway as well. Now, when you watch the available footage of the guy apparently using the Triton Gills in the Kickstarter campaign video, it's pretty easy to notice that he is exhaling bubbles. And so someone might think, hey, he must be breathing through his gills if he's exhaling, right? He's got to get that air from somewhere, right? Well, something to consider is at the start of the video, you can tell that he's kind of having to fight not floating to the surface, but towards the end of it, he's easily just kind of like shimmying around at the bottom. And so what a lot of people have speculated what this guy is doing is the Triton gills are doing pretty much nothing here. Instead, what he's doing is he just took a giant breath of air before filming. And as he's filming, he's just letting out a little bit of air at a time. And when he lets out air, it kind of gives out the illusion that he's like, he already breathed through his gales and now he's exhaling. But in reality, he's never breathing in at all. He's just slowly letting air out. It looks pretty likely that a similar tactic was being used in the now missing 47 second video. Now, besides this campaign, having a video that's almost certainly not showing functioning Triton gills, there are a lot of other reasons this campaign is probably fake. I'm not really going to get into it too much here, but there are a lot of articles you can read online about all the reasons the Triton Gills are pretty much impossible with current technology. Now, this Indiegogo campaign managed to raise nearly $900,000, but before they could collect their money, Indiegogo forced them to refund everybody, close the campaign, and then relaunch a new campaign. On this new campaign, they explained why they had to do this, and the reason was because in their first campaign, they had been a little bit dishonest with how the Triton Gills actually worked to protect their proprietary technology, apparently. Apparently, the Triton Gills actually ran off of small liquid oxygen tanks, and this new campaign was making light of this. Well, looking into this, it kind of looks like small liquid oxygen tanks would not be 
feasible for something like this either. Liquid oxygen needs to be kept at negative 180 degrees Celsius, and you're also not allowed to ship the stuff in the US. So this whole liquid oxygen tank thing was probably just made up as well. Despite this second campaign almost certainly being just as fake as the first one, they managed to raise almost $500,000. But it looks like Indiegogo finally came to terms with the fact that this thing was either fake or a scam, and they had to get it off their website, and they eventually took down this campaign and refunded everybody their money, and after that, the Triton Gills pretty much just disappeared. Smalt. Smalt is a smart salt shaker. Smalt, the world's first interactive centerpiece. Track your salt intake, stream your favorite music, and set the dining ambience with mood lighting. Smalt is the perfect complement to any meal and a great way to shake up the night. Play your favorite music through Smalt's impressive Bluetooth speakers and set the mood with multicolored lighting. Plus, you can track your salt intake for a healthier dining experience. What are some of the features of the Smalt? Uh, it's got a display, mood light, a Bluetooth speaker, a dial, a mode button, an ergonomic design, and a smart salt dispenser. Designed to entertain and set the mood. What mood are we setting with this? Honey, you haven't touched your food all night. What's wrong? I I'm trying to get the, the salt shaker to connect. Innovation of the week, the Boston Globe. Innovation of the week. Set the perfect ambience with Smalt's color-changing mood light. Smalt comes with Amazon Alexa integration for the times you need an extra hand. Simply say, Alexa, dispense half a teaspoon of salt. I'm gonna have an Amazon Echo and a smart salt shaker in one home. Sleek modern design makes small a sexy way to entertain. A conversation piece. Conversation piece. Dude, why do you have this? So small was looking for $25,000 to make the small a reality and they only got $9,400. And so uh, unfortunately the small did not come to fruition. The Digit Soul Smart Shoe. <laughs> There are people uh, you would wear these around and you would never, never, ever, ever hear the end of it. Accurate tracking, auto tightening, coaching and monitoring, 3D walk analyzer, Bluetooth connected, smart heating, cushioning monitoring, battery powered, ultralight water resistant. And yeah, with all of these awesome features on these shoes, they have to have a battery. So don't forget to plug in your shoes after a long night out. Dude, I won't be able to make it. My shoes are charging. Whether you're a techie who always has the latest gadget, a sneaker head on top of trends, athlete or health tracking enthusiast, the smart shoe is something for you. The Digit Soul smart shoe needed $50,000 to reach its funding goal, and it got a little over $114,000. But after the money was collected, there was three years of them updating on the progress of the shoe. But in 2019, they just kind of came out with an update on their Kickstarter page where they said that they had canceled the project. Apparently, they had run into technical constraints. They had problems with R&D, and apparently they couldn't make the shoes last long enough to make a product that they thought would satisfy customers. They said that they would be giving refunds to people who funded the project. From the looks of it, quite a lot of people did get refunds, but also reading through the comments on this Kickstarter, it looks like there were some people that didn't get refunds for some reason. Spoony. This was a Kickstarter campaign for a spoon that had a built-in fan that would cool your food off. Yeah, this one didn't get funded. The bug juggler. So what do you think the bug juggler is? Take a moment think about it all right place your bets what do you think it is it's a robot that juggles cars yeah there was this kickstarter campaign that was ran by this guy who wanted to make a robot that could juggle cars they asked for fifty thousand. they got a little over a thousand so funding was unsuccessful could you imagine hey dude have you seen my car i can't remember where i parked it up Oh, shit. Box. So this was a Kickstarter campaign for a smart bottle opener. So what's so smart about this bottle opener? Well, uh, it will connect by Bluetooth to your phone so that when you open a bottle, it'll automatically send a message to people saying you opened a bottle so you can let people know what's up. This would be a great gift for that alcoholic friend you want to keep tabs on. So this Kickstarter campaign did actually manage to get funded and they did actually manufacture these things. So maybe it wouldn't be fair to call this a Kickstarter failure. Maybe we could just call it a societal failure or something. Stompy. So this was a Kickstarter campaign that was trying to make a six-legged robot. This Kickstarter campaign did actually get funded, but it looks like development of this thing has kind of tapered off. It honestly looks like they got pretty decently far into development. They were supposed to give backers rides on this thing, but it doesn't look like they've ever actually gotten around to it.
Dark Skies. So in April of 2014, a campaign for a game called Dark Skies showed up on Kickstarter. Dark Skies, an epic brony dating sim. The game was asking for $7,500 in funding, and the Kickstarter campaign goes on to read, four years in the making, Dark Skies is not your average dating sim. It is a journey that spans multiple continents, a quest of good against evil, and a search for true love, fulfillment, and self-discovery, all rolled into one. You're the new pony in town, you've got a lot to prove, and any respect you get must be earned. Most of the ponies in Cirrus City are nice, but they definitely don't trust strangers right off the bat, so you'll have to work hard to get them to warm up to you and build a network of real friends to help you when times get tough. And yeah, as you've probably kind of seen here, the Kickstarter page for this game was really hamming things up. They were saying this game was gonna have deep RPG elements, 100 plus hours of gameplay. They said that the game was being developed by industry veterans. The in-game ponies were gonna have actual voice acting. This Kickstarter the Kickstarter campaign also featured a video trailer, and this trailer is narrated by a puppet character that you can barely even understand. What's up, everypony? I go by the handle Psychoactive Charm. And probably the best part of it is when they show off the voice actors that are going to be in the game. My name is Pumpkin Pie, and I'm the smartest pony in the whole school. By my calculations, you'll be falling in love with me. The only question is... Will I fall in love with you? What do you want? My name's Jet, and if you touch me, you're dead. Think you had it rough? Try growing up without a father. I'm Starshine. I guess I'm the type of pony who's always staring off into space, wondering if there's something more waiting for a pony like her. Uh, it looks like some people were willing to put money towards this game. In fact, according to KickTrack, by day four, they had already raised over half of their goal. But then things started getting messy. As some of you guys have noticed, uh, the Kickstarter uh, doesn't feel completely serious. It feels like kind of like a joke or something. Before this campaign reached its goal, a bunch of people on different forums around the internet started finding connections between this project and Sam Hyde. Sam Hyde is a pretty interesting guy. Most would probably call him a comedian, but he's done a lot of other stuff over the years. He's also a pretty controversial person, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this video. Just know that his style of humor usually involves trolling and messing with people and stuff along those lines. And creating a fake dating brony sim sounds pretty on brand for him. There's quite a few different connections you can find between this campaign and Sam Hyde. Right off the bat, it's pretty obvious that the narrator puppet character from the trailer is just Sam Hyde's voice. What's up, everypony? I go by the handle Psychoactive Charm. There's very few circumstances where it makes sense to go about it in a roundabout, weaselly, passive way. Also, on top of that, on Facebook, Sam Hyde had mentioned that he was working on something involving My Little Pony, and he was in need of illustrators and game designers. Also, he posted a couple YouTube videos where he was talking about how he needed voice actors for a My Little Pony dating sim that he was working on. I need the hottest the hottest, the hottest girls out there. Hot girls, hot girls. <laughs> MDE is doing a brony dating sim. I need hot girls to be the voiceover actresses for the MDE dating sim. There are a bunch of other connections I could mention that people found between Dark Skies and Sam Hyde, but to make a long story short, a lot of people in the brony community came to realize that Sam Hyde was actually behind this project. After four days into the campaign, funding for the project really seemed to taper off. In fact, there ended up being quite a few refunds even, and this was probably at least in part due to a lot of bronies realizing that Sam Hyde was actually behind this project. Funding for the Kickstarter project was was canceled on the last day. And from what I can tell, everybody got refunds. Now, kind of an interesting part about this is it looks like a lot of people online were under the impression that this was just like an attempt to scam people out of money and there wasn't ever actually a uh, Dark Skies brony dating sim. But Sam Hyde has gone on record saying that he was actually trying to make this game and he wasn't just gonna try and like do a rug pull and run with the money. So there's people, there's people now still like bronies who like look at this Thing that was going to scam them. The thing is, the thing is, I would have made it into a game. Yeah. Like I don't want to get a, I didn't want to get a class action lawsuit yeah. from these people that didn't have a game developed. I wanted to, I was going to actually make a fucking game. It would have been like hilarious, but uh, 
the Ouya. So in 2013, a Kickstarter campaign was launched for a game console called the Ouya. When it comes to the main selling points of the Ouya on this Kickstarter, one of the big selling points was the Ouya was supposed to be a console that would be really easy for indie developers to get their games onto. It would be an easy way for indie developers to make their games playable on a TV without having to try and put their game onto the Wii U, PS4, or Xbox One. Another one of the major selling points of this console was that it was pretty small. It was like, yay big, could easily fit under your TV. And they said that the controller for the thing was really nice. It doesn't really seem like that ended up being the case, but that was one of the things they were trying to sell people on. Um, it was pretty cheap at only $100. This $100 price tag comes at the cost of this thing's performance. Uh, it's not very powerful. The processor in this thing was basically on par with like mobile phone processors at the time. I guess kind of the idea was the thing didn't really need to be too powerful though. It wasn't really supposed to be playing AAA games. It would be playing like small indie games or whatever. Now this Kickstarter campaign asked for $1 million to make this thing happen. And it actually managed to receive $8 million. I mean, based on that, it looked like the Ouya might find some success. The Ouya did actually release later in 2013. However, after the thing actually dropped and came out and it turned out that the console actually kind of sucked. Most reviews of this thing said it was pretty mid, if not just kind of straight up bad. A lot of people seem to really hate the controller on this thing. Some said it felt cheap and flimsy and had squishy buttons and it would just fall apart while you're using it. The console also didn't really have a lot of games on it that would really make it worth buying. Of course, it wasn't really hard for any developer to just put their game on this console, so there ended up being a lot of stuff that just wasn't very good at all. And although this console did have some good indie games, there weren't really enough to justify buying this thing, especially considering that you could probably play these games on PC and mobile anyway. And the big name consoles at the time were starting to embrace indie games more and more. The Ouya ended up selling around 200,000 units. This really wasn't enough to keep the company afloat. Ouya ended up selling off all of its assets just two years after their console launch. Although in the end, Ouya did manage to actually release a console. The public reception on this thing was pretty bad, and a lot of people would probably feel pretty comfortable calling this thing a failure. And the Ouya is kind of regarded as a joke in a lot of gaming communities online nowadays days, Backmeal. So uh, there was this Kickstarter campaign for this app called Backmeal. And I guess what this was supposed to be uh, was an app people could sell food on. I kind of, it all, it kind of looks like this app was trying to get people to sell their leftovers on this app. Uh, this Kickstarter campaign wanted a little over $100,000 and they only got 150. So, uh, this one didn't do too well. It would be pretty hard to convince people to want to use this pop theater. So what is the pop theater? Well, the Kickstarter campaign reads, pop theater is your own private theater that provides you with a comfortable personal viewing experience when watching on your mobile device. No longer will you face distraction and constant discomfort when you could be enjoying your movie or show to the fullest extent. So basically what this thing is, is it's a little tent that you pop up and then you put your face in it. And then on top of the tent, you can put your phone on it and then you can like watch a movie or whatever like this. And it's supposed to be a good experience. Gone are the days of trying to find a comfortable position to watch YouTube videos in your bed. I mean, if you were the type of person who would want to use this thing in public, you just kind of have to be okay with the fact that you'd look like someone who's just passed out on a lawn with a trash can dunked over your head. I came up with something called the Pop Theater Challenge. You're supposed to get one of these and then go to a public space like a park or something and try and get through all eight seasons of Big Mouth while using this thing. How long will you make it? This campaign asked for $40,000, but they only managed to get about $14,000. Who's dating my daughter? So this was a Kickstarter campaign for an app that was supposed to be used to keep track of who your daughter's dating. The Kickstarter campaign says that it will be a teen dating website controlled by parents. So based on the description on this Kickstarter, the vision for this app was dudes who are looking to get into dating would make a profile on this app where they would like list off some of their attributes such as name, age, GPA, hobbies, does he drive and sports activities? And then I think what would happen then is then parents can leave reviews 
on past dates that this guy has gone on with their daughter. I don't even think the vision is daughters would be leaving reviews. I think it would be parents who would be leaving reviews. And then the Kickstarter says that the things that the parents would review the dudes on would be punctuality, politeness, and demonstration of respect. They could also leave reviews on things like tattoos or piercings. Yeah, so this Kickstarter campaign asked for $150,000 to make this app a reality and they got $2, the Saucman Satchel. So this was a Kickstarter campaign that was for a satchel that was designed to hold sauces. It was targeted at people that really needed to carry their sauces on the go. This Kickstarter campaign was headed by a guy who played in Tenacious D. The Saucman Satchel never did reach his funding goal, but it looks like some satchels might have gotten manufactured anyway, or something at least close to them. So maybe you can still find one around somewhere or something. The Air Umbrella. So there was this Kickstarter campaign I was trying to get funding to make an air umbrella. The air umbrella was supposed to shoot a gust of air out the top of it to block rain from hitting you. This Kickstarter campaign asked for $10,000 in funding and it managed to get over $100,000 in funding. I'm pretty sure a normal umbrella would be more practical than this thing in like pretty much every way. But let's say it's not about the practicality. Let's say you wanted the air umbrella because I don't know, it would be a status symbol. Well, about two years after the campaign was funded, they just posted an update on the Kickstarter saying that the project was canceled. In this update, they mention issues with mass production and the safety of the thing. They said that they were gonna try and get people refunds, but it doesn't look like everybody got one. Kind of a funny part about this whole situation too is after this project got canceled in 2016, there was this one user on Kickstarter who went by the name of Michael, who apparently never got a refund for his air umbrella. And so for pretty much the last seven years, Michael has been in the comments of the Air Umbrella Kickstarter, still asking for a refund. It looks like he's kind of slowed down as of late, but his last update was nine months ago, and he was saying that it was day 3000 of him not getting it yet. It looks like he gave this Kickstarter campaign $128. This Michael guy ended up kind of turning into a meme, and he ended up meeting up with Moist Critical and a couple other YouTubers in real life. They ended up giving him his very own Air Umbrella that they made out of an electric a leaf blower. So depending on who you ask, this Kickstarter campaign might not be considered a failure because they got funded and it looks like they were able to deliver their rewards to backers. So what this campaign was, was the person who was running it wanted to make a font out of the shape of their kid's sh I'm going to go ahead and blur it just to be careful because, you know, YouTube, but just so you have an image in your head, it's a font that's made out of logs of sh so if you backed this campaign, you'd get postcards that use this font, or apparently they were also selling letter magnets that use this font. I think this campaign was supposed to be like cutesy and funny or whatever, and that's how some people probably look at it. But I'd also imagine quite a few people would find this just straight up weird. I don't know, moving on, I don't want to talk about this one anymore chip smart cookie oven so this was a kickstarter campaign that was for a smart cookie oven it was this kitchen appliance that was dedicated to making cookies they were also trying to sell a cookie dough subscription along with this thing i think kind of the idea of this thing was you would use it if you just wanted to make like three or four cookies at once and not a whole batch honestly i think this is a little bit of a silly thing because you know just because you have a big oven doesn't mean that you can't put like just a few cookies in the oven you don't need to make a whole pan's worth. You can just make three or four. You don't need a dedicated appliance. I guess maybe if you're like a college student or someone who doesn't have an oven, then maybe you could justify this thing if you were really a cookie connoisseur. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a hater and the smart cookie oven really is the future. Oh, never mind. Yeah, this thing did get funded, but they ended up canceling the project. It looks like most people got refunds. So the coolest cooler is probably one of the biggest debacles to take place on Kickstarter. The coolest cooler was basically supposed to be a cooler with a bunch of different accessories on it. Built onto the coolest cooler, there was gonna be a bottle opener, extra storage for plates, gear tie down, LED lights, a USB charger, a waterproof, Bluetooth speaker and a blender. The coolest cooler asked for $50,000 in funding and it managed to get 
million. People wanted this goddamn cooler. In fact, at the time, this was actually the biggest Kickstarter campaign ever. It had raised more money than any Kickstarter campaign ever before. If you donated $185 to this Kickstarter campaign, they said that they would give you your very own coolest cooler, and 50,000 people donated at this $185 tier. So they had a lot of coolers that they had to make. But after this thing raised funding, it basically just turned into a never-ending fiasco. Explaining all the things that went down with this thing would take quite a while, so I'll just keep it brief and hit the main points. After this thing got funded, they really struggled to get the manufacturing overhead to make this thing. They weren't able to manufacture the thing at the price that they wanted to. Also, there was a point where they were selling coolers on Amazon before all of the people who would back the project had gotten their coolers, and this left some backers pretty upset. Ultimately, all of these shenanigans kind of eventually led to the Oregon Department of Justice Justice investigating the coolest cooler. They ended up reaching a settlement where they were going to force the coolest cooler to give back refunds to people who never got their cooler, but it was not a full refund. Most of the time, they only had to give back $20 to people who had bought the $185 cooler, and in some cases, the refund was even less than that. Let's just take a look at some of these endgame stats. 20,762 people never received their cooler. Those who did not receive coolers were entitled to $20 in compensation. However, just seven 7,232 actually received the money. Another 13,530 did not receive their cooler or their $20. Star Citizen. Not to be confused with Starfield, it's Star Citizen. So in 2012, a Kickstarter campaign was launched for a game called Star Citizen. This game was going to be developed by a company called Cloud Imperium Games, and the lead developer of this game would be a guy by the name of Chris Roberts. Chris Roberts is a guy that's been in the game industry for quite a while now, and he's put out quite a few pretty good games over the years. Probably the most notable video game to come from this guy is the Wing Commander series. Uh, the first game released in 1990 it was pretty good and it was pretty innovative for its time. And so for many people, seeing Chris Roberts lead this project probably made them feel like this project would be worth backing. So what is Star Citizen? Well, based on what this original Kickstarter outlines, the vision for this game was pretty ambitious. To kind of give a summary of what this Kickstarter describes this game as, they kind of describe it as this space simulator exploration type game. They said that the game would have a persistent universe, meaning like even when you log off the game, stuff is still going on in the universe. The game was also supposed to be like really detailed as well. Like for example, the cockpits of all the like spaceships in the game would be fully modeled out. The game was also supposed to have a pretty enormous scale. Like for example, in one of the original trailers on the Kickstarter, there's a clip of him walking around on what's supposed to be like a space deck on a spaceship. And he says that it's about a kilometer in size. The carrier uh, that's in the prototype level is about a kilometer in size. And he mentions that there's like supposed to be a lot of different things you should be able to do in this space universe. Like for example, in the original pitch video for this game, there's a part where he's like, you can be whatever you want. You could decide to be a merchant or you could decide to be a pirate. And then it's open world. You can go where you want, do what you want, choose who you want to be. You can get into the star unit. You can basically decide you're never going to go fight in the military. You can decide that I'm just going to be a merchant or I'm just going to be a pirate. The original Kickstarter for this game also mentions that alongside Star Citizen, they would also be releasing a game that they were calling Squadron 42, which was supposed to be this like single player component to the game. Anyway, this game, I mean, very ambitious stuff, right? The original Kickstarter campaign set the funding goal at half a million dollars and it managed to receive over $2 million. Also, the campaign suggested that the game would release at some time in 2014. That was, you know, almost a decade ago now. Now, is the game out right now? Sort of, kind of, not really, but also kind of. Starting in 2014, they started releasing bits and pieces of the game through different modules and updates. They've continued to push out more mechanics and things for the game in different updates and modules for almost the last decade now. And and this approach to releasing the game over the years has definitely not made everybody happy. From the looks of it, it doesn't really look like Cloud Imperium Games is gonna ever just do a straight up release of the game ever. They're just gonna continue updating things. Oh yeah, and Squadron 42, the single player component of the game, there has been no release of that at all, and there's no projected release date of it either. Only the open world persistent universe aspect of the game is out right now, and online there are a lot of different opinions on the current state of it, but we'll get into that more in a second. Now, one of the biggest things that you kind of have to talk about when it comes to Star Citizen is the fact that uh, this game raised more than, uh, well, $2 million. 
If you go to robertspaceindustries.com, which is basically like the official Star Citizen website or whatever, according to this website, as of the time of me making this video, they've raised nearly $600 million. So how do they manage to raise $600 million? Like where is this money coming from? I've seen differing things on exactly how this figure is calculated and what it includes and what it doesn't, but there are quite a few different places uh, Cloud Emporium Games has gotten money from over the years. First and foremost, when you you buy the game right now, you have to buy like a $45 starter pack. And so I think anyone who's bought the game right now, that money goes towards this funds raised thing. But probably one of the most controversial sources of money that Cloud Emporium Games has raised that goes towards this number is over the years, Cloud Emporium Games has been selling in-game ships for Star Citizen. But buying these ships, it's no regular DLC. Some of these things will cost more than a car payment. Some of the ships that they're selling will go for over $1,000. Now, you don't need to buy a $1,000 ship to play this game. You can just buy a cheap starter ship and just kind of work your way up. But people do buy these things. Like I mentioned, the game is kind of out right now. If you go onto the Star Citizen website, you can buy one of the starter packs that comes with one of the starter ships. You download the client and you can get in and you can play the game. And so you might be wondering, so has all of this money, this $600 million gone towards a good project? Well, to give you a complete idea of the actual state of this game, we would have to go complete video essay mode for two hours and I don't think we want to do that right now but people who complain about this game usually complain about the game can be pretty buggy sometimes it can be pretty hard to figure out what to do in the game without a guide just because things are so complicated sometimes also there's quite a few complaints of this game suffering from feature creep over the years as Cloud Emporium Games has gotten more and more funding they've said that they're gonna add more and more features and some people seem to think that this has kind of blown the scope of the game up too big but on the flip side, people who like this game usually like how deep and complicated some of the mechanics in this game are. People also seem to like the scale of the universe the game takes place in, and you're kind of free to do what you want. This is just kind of an oversimplified summary of what's been going on with this game. There is seriously so much stuff you could talk about, and I'm glossing over so much. For this video, I'm just going to leave it off here, but here are some other videos you could watch if you want to know more about this game. Or you could just do your own research or whatever, I don't know. Scoot. So there was this Kickstarter campaign that was trying to make this thing called the Scoot. They kind of describe it as a combination of a longboard and a bicycle. And this is what it would look like. You know, there are a lot of reasons you could probably find something like this kind of silly. You know, it has the footprint of a whole bicycle, but it's probably only going to be as efficient as a longboard. Maybe a little bit more efficient because of the big wheels. They asked for $15,000 to make this thing happen, and they only got a little over $2,000 the run and roll it. So the run and roll it was supposed to be this toy thing and the toy is like this hoop and you push the hoop along with the stick and you try and keep it rolling. You were supposed to be able to do tricks with it if you get good with it or something. It's kind of funny because they're sort of edging on advertising this thing as like a new invention or something. Hoop rolling is not at all a new thing. People have been doing hoop rolling since like ancient Greece. They asked for $100,000 to make the run and roll it a reality and they got 30 1500 bucks, so they didn't quite make it. Gas. So this was a Kickstarter campaign for a game that looked like this. <laughs> I think you kind of get the idea. Beat balls. So what this Kickstarter project was, was it was for a machine that was supposed to be able to make meatballs that tasted like how certain music sounds. So I think the way this would work was there was gonna be a beat balls app. And so what would happen is you would use this app to analyze a song of your choice. And then this app would like custom design a meatball that was supposed to taste like how that song sounds. So I guess like, for example, a meatball that would be based off of the song Happy by Pharrell would have chickpeas, strawberries, curry, garlic, lemon zest, and Thai basil in it. And then I think they would like deliver the meatballs to you that were based on your song. Also, the video that accompanied this Kickstarter campaign had a girl just slobbering on this guy's ear. I don't think I should have any problems showing this on YouTube, but I'm just gonna not. This Kickstarter campaign asked for $350,000 and they got $9,000 the Scarp Laser Razor. So in 2015, a company called Scarp Technologies launched a Kickstarter for something they called the Scarp Laser Razor. It was supposed to be a razor 
that instead of using like physical metal razors, it would use lasers to uh, cut your hair. Shaving as we know it is far from perfect. Once working on lasers for cosmetic and medical purposes, I wondered, could I put this technology to better use? I wanted something that would benefit every single one of us. Shaving was the obvious answer. Well, something to mention that's outlined in this original Kickstarter page about the laser razor is this thing doesn't use like a laser in the way you might be thinking. So the way this thing supposedly worked was according to their Kickstarter, what they say they did was after years of research, they discovered a particular chromophore that's in hair. And apparently when you shoot a particular wavelength of light at this chromophore, it breaks the hair. And so what they were gonna do is they were gonna run an optical fiber across the head of the razor and then they would shoot the wavelength of light through the optical fiber and then whenever this optical fiber would touch hair it would break it and that's how it would work okay sure cool but does it work though is it legit well on the original kickstarter page for this thing they actually did have a video showing off a prototype of this thing um and this prototype looks pretty far off from being able to be uh, any good at all. In this video, they sh they're showing off this like prototype razor laser uh, and it's not looking good, man. You can see them like trying to like shave hair off of this guy's wrist. I mean, you see the thing like bumping into the hair but not cutting it and they have to like come through like a bunch of times. It looks so finicky and awkward and weird. I mean, if you were actually trying to get a shave done with this thing, I mean, you would be there for probably like hours. Now in the Kickstarter campaign, they mentioned that if they get funding for their laser razor, uh, they'll be able to get a higher quality fiber in manufacturing and they'll be able to mount the fiber on the razor better. And so supposedly if they got their funding, they'd be able to deliver a razor that works better than the one that they showed off in the prototype video. Well, it looks like a lot of people believed them on that because this thing got over $4 million in funding. But before the funding period ended and Scarp was able to collect their money, Kickstarter came in and suspended the project. Why did they suspend the project? Well, according to an article by The Register, the reason they canceled this Kickstarter project was because all Kickstarter projects require a working prototype, and I guess this prototype didn't meet their standards. I wonder why. Also, a little bit later down the line, Scarp Technologies went on to say that Kickstarter kicked the them off of their platform because they didn't like the fact that Scarp said that their prototype was going to be different than what the actual product was going to be. Here's kind of where the funny part of the story comes in. Less than a day after this campaign was suspended on Kickstarter, Scarp launched a new campaign on Indiegogo. This campaign on Indiegogo was basically the exact same thing as it was on Kickstarter. The Indiegogo campaign managed to get funded with half a million dollars back in 2015. So where is the Scarp Razor Laser today? Well, it still has not come out. Seven years ago, they got half a million dollars, nothing still. Since 2015, Scarp has posted on and off updates on the Indiegogo page, but there was never really a lot of good news. These updates never really seemed to indicate that they were getting the technology to work well, and they were kind of just continuously pushing back the projected release date of this thing. The most recent update Scarp has posted on the Laser Razor was in 2022, and they said they were hoping to have positive news in quarter one of 2023. Well, we're past quarter one of 2023, and there was never any update. And so things are really not looking good for Scarp Razor Laser backers, especially considering it looks like they might have filed for bankruptcy. Seems like it's not entirely clear what happened with Scarp behind the scenes, but I think it's pretty safe to say that things didn't pan out particularly well. The Feel. What is The Feel? Well, The Feel rediscovered the joy of writing by hand. Tablet plus pen plus pencil. Meet the analogic device to rediscover the magic manual gesture of writing and drawing. The manual gesture of writing and drawing. In The Feel, wood and metal come together in a unique ensemble whose every detail helps recreate the alchemical, almost therapeutic experience of writing by hand. Make no mistake, this thing is a clipboard that is a little bit nicer than a normal clipboard. It has two little slots on the back that you can hide, two little pens and pencils in it, and it has a magnet in it that you can use to clip paper to it, and that's it. But this Kickstarter campaign pitches this thing like it's the second coming of Christ. The equilibrium and finesse of Italian craftsmanship the poetry of drawing and writing on paper embedded in the human soul. 
the discretion and elegant neatness. Yeah, I'm gonna stop it there, but kind of this whole ad is like this. I mean, in this video, they're talking like it's 2007 and they're announcing the iPhone for the first time. Oh, but this campaign gets even better than that too. If you want one of these things, you need to back the campaign for a minimum of 199 euros. Ah, uh, this is what that looks like in USD. And that doesn't even come with the pens and pencils. To get the full kit, you need to pay at least 249 euros, which looks like this in USD. And apparently this is a good deal because the retail price for the thing is supposed to be 499 euros, which looks like this in USD. It's a slab of wood with two slots in it and a magnet. Now they don't say anything about it being made out of like a nice kind of wood or anything. I mean, if I was paying $218 for this thing, this would need to be made out of some like rare Amazonian petrified nine grain papaya wood or some crazy thing like that. This Kickstarter campaign asked for a little under $5,000 and they actually managed to break this and they got like $8,000. But before the funding period ended, Kickstarter ended up just suspending this thing, which is uh, ironic considering this thing managed to get onto the projects we love page for Kickstarter, which I think is curated by Kickstarter. Now, as far as I can tell, it's not completely clear why this project got suspended. We can really only speculate on what happened. Some comments on Reddit suggest it might be possible that the funding was being artificially inflated by a select few people. Something like that happening would lead Kickstarter to step in and suspend the project. Also, apparently this Kickstarter campaign was fully funded within under an hour, which honestly to me feels kind of suspicious. Maybe someday we'll get a better explanation on what happened here. The Gordonator. What is the Gordonator? Well, according to their Kickstarter page, the Gordonator might be the most important project you have ever looked at. This Kickstarter campaign made by a man by the name of of Bartley Scarborough, and apparently he also has a team working with him, claims that they've invented a machine that can create infinite electricity, and they're calling it the Gordonator. So how does the Gordonator apparently work? Well, they don't go into too much detail on this Kickstarter page because they say they don't want people to steal their idea, but they let on a little bit how they say this thing's gonna work. I'll just read you how they explain the Gordonator working. This Kickstarter page has this picture of a roller coaster on it, and then they say, look again, at the above picture, which is that of a roller coaster going downhill. This is the exact principle of the Gordonator. A Gordonator is simply a roller coaster with no riders, and you guessed it, many more wheels than a conventional roller coaster. When a roller coaster is pulled up to its highest point by a winch, it becomes loaded with potential energy, as it is now high and now ready to use the force of gravity to descend. As it descends, what happens? Its wheels spin. The Gordonator will be a boring roller coaster with no violent twists or turns. Remember, we aren't trying to entertain thrill seekers here. We are only interested in spinning wheels and generating electricity. So the Gordonator starts very high and the natural, crystal clean and forever available and totally free force of gravity is precisely what we are going to use to generate electricity or to spin our wheels. It's just that simple. They also go on to say that after this roller coaster generator gets to the bottom of the tracks, they say it will get caught by by our winch at the ground and then elevated up to its 1,200 feet high peak and the cycle will be repeated endlessly. Each time of course generating more electricity which will go right onto the power grid. The energy needed to power the winch is insignificant. Like I think they're saying that like as the thing's going down the tracks and spinning the wheel it will produce more than enough electricity to lift it back up to the top again and so they can just keep running it back and forth and they just keep getting like excess electricity and that's the infinite electricity glitch they found. Could you imagine if this was like the biggest moment in history and it was just a guy on Kickstarter who was like, yeah, so if you just give me like a million bucks, I can give humanity infinite electricity forever. Obviously I'm no scientist and harass me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the reason something like this wouldn't work is because of what the laws of thermodynamics say. The first law of thermodynamics says that you can't get more energy out of a system than you put in, but they're saying the coordinator does basically exactly that. The coordinator team wanted $100,000 to make the coordinator happen. They got nine. So we didn't get to see this thing. I don't know. Why is it called the coordinator? The coordinator. <laughs>
<laughs> stock chat. The stock chat app. Doesn't that sound like something you want to use? Uh, so there have been three separate Kickstarter campaigns for this thing called stock chat, and all three of them have not met their funding goal. So what is stock chat? You might be wondering, why aren't they reaching their funding goal? What's going on here? So the way I think stock chat is supposed to work is you sign up for a stock chat account, and then what you can do is you can like sign in to what are basically like security cameras just around in places. And if someone walks in front of this security camera, you can like send them a message if they're also a stock chat user. And so you can kind of just sit and watch these security cameras. And if someone that looks interesting to you walks in front of this security camera, you can send them a message if they have a stock chat account. They advertise this thing as like a way to make friends, but I don't even know. How would you even start a conversation? Keep in mind, the people you're going to meet on this app are just completely random people you're watching on camera. They might have no idea you're watching them and you're just sending them a message. Like seriously, what would your opener be on something like this? Hey bro, I'm looking at you on cam right now. If it goes hard. I don't know who this is for exactly. I kind of get the feeling that most people would find this whole thing pretty creepy. The Kickstarter page mentions that anybody can like decide to add their security camera to the like stock chat app if they want to. In fact, they even mention that they'll pay you to like add your security camera to this. You know, I'd imagine like if you were a stock chat user, like every time you step in front of a security camera, you just gotta kinda come to terms with the fact that anybody could be looking at you right now. And uh, they also have your name now. And that could probably lead to quite a few weird things happening depending on who you are and who's watching you. It also looks like this whole stock chat thing would have quite a few different security and legal concerns incentivizing people with money to put up security cameras in public places so they can live stream to viewers online is probably going to run into all sorts of issues on many different fronts. They say on the Kickstarter page that they're not going to save like any of the security camera footage, but at the end of the day, I don't think there's any way to stop people from recording stuff on the user end. At the end of the day, I can always just like point my phone at my monitor and like record stuff. There's also one more thing I should probably mention before we move on. So, you know, with a name like Stock Chat, it would probably lead a lot of people to question uh, who the target demographic uh, for this app would be. However, I'm pretty sure the people behind this app are not native English speakers. And when they named the app Stock Chat, they didn't fully understand the connotations of the word stock. In fact, on their most recent Kickstarter, they made a comment where they said that they were going to change the name of the app to Watch Chat App. It looks like they've been trying to transition the project to be under the name Watch Chat App now. Now, which I would say is probably a better name. You know, it's a little bit less overtly creepy than the name Stock Chat, but it doesn't really look like they've gotten particularly far with the project overall. Their website right now is really bare bones and has pretty much nothing you can do on it. They have a sign in page on this website, like you can set up an account with them. I thought maybe if you set up an account, there might be more to see on this website. So I tried setting up an account, but it never worked. So I don't know what's going on here. Clean Cloud power. Yeah, this one's really dumb and just like one of the hardest scams on here. Uh, this is an app that apparently would allow you to download electricity from the cloud. This app would support Windows, Android, iPhone, Tesla. It needed $27 million to get funded. It got zero. Unfortunately, the Kickstarter campaign video for this thing got taken down. So one can only imagine how incredible that thing probably was. <laughs> A new mathematical system. Uh, this Kickstarter campaign was launched in 2017, and the title reads, I have created the foundation for Mathematics 2.0 with the help of my information logical systems. I have the foundation of a new mathematical system that explains absolute everything in the entire universe from the beginning to the end and makes it dead easy to understand the entire existence and its mechanisms. This project asked for a little bit over $9 million and they got like 180. Adoptly. So Adoptly was like Tinder, but for adopting kids. I would talk more about this one, but this whole thing ended up just being a troll and it never actually existed. So moving on. Kickstarter, succeed first time. Yeah, so this Kickstarter campaign was launched in 2015 and it was for a book that was supposed to teach you how to run a successful Kickstarter campaign. Alas, it never reached its funding goal. 
So guess no one will never know how to do it. From the looks of it, it doesn't look like the author ended up releasing this book ever. I did a little bit of digging and I never found it. I found this article where he said the situation was kind of ironic. In 2017, a Kickstarter campaign was launched for the Demo Fist. The Demo Fist was looking to revolutionize hammer technology. Yeah, so the whole point of this thing was for it to be a replacement to the hammer. The Kickstarter videos show these guys having a lot of fun with this thing. Dude, imagine pulling up to the job site with the Demo Fist. The Demo Fists needed $11,000 to get funded, but they only managed to get $7,000. So unfortunately, the Demo Fist, I guess, just wasn't meant to be. Despite this Kickstarter's failure, it does look like the developers managed to manufacture some Demo Fists and get them out, but they might be kind of hard to track down now. But if you're dedicated, you might be able to get your hands on a Demo Fist. My theory with the Demo Fists is Kickstarter has a rule against uh, having campaigns for weapons, but I think this might have been these guys' uh, creative way to work around this. Could you imagine using the Demo Fist in a self-defense scenario. Your opponent's not coming out alive. The man who laughs. Uh, this was a Kickstarter for a guy who wanted to make his own independent Joker film. I'm working on a completely independent Joker film. It's a modern day psychological comic horror. I've been working on this for one year. He told me I was a clown, that I was a joke. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of just a guy like talking into a camera with a Snapchat filter on. He needed $10,000 for this Kickstarter campaign and he got 61. So cool, bro. World's first breath powered everyday carry fan. Fan yourself with your own breathing, an innovative way to cool down. So uh, basically all this thing is, is a straw that you're supposed to put in your mouth. And then when you breathe out, it blows the air onto you and then it cools you off. And that's it. Cool bro needed 3,800 to buy tube to make this happen. Uh, they only made 420, so funding was not successful. Taka, winter is coming. Keep your hands warm with Taka, a redesigned mofle for the modern age, made from the bottom of the Canadian heart. So this thing's for like, if you're cranking out balloons tower defense games in Siberia, or you're trying to cosplay as a Minecraft villager, the Taka had a funding goal of $15,000, but it only managed to get 1,163. Meme restaurant, a Kickstarter campaign for a meme themed restaurant. When Sean and his siblings were driving home from a day out, he decided to voice out loud. What if if there was a restaurant that had food based on memes, the idea was born. So probably the best part of this Kickstarter page is they had a menu for all of the things that would be at this meme themed restaurant, all the different uh, menu items you could order. The Execute Hors d'oeuvres, Lord of the Onion Rings, Pickleless Cage, The Rick Roll, The Chocolate Rain, The PPAP. For lunch and dinner, you could get the Somebody Touch on My Spaghetti, The Haram Burger, The Cash Me Outside Street Tacos, The Idiot Sandwich, Trollo Low Fat Salad, The Coffee coffee. For, uh, the juice bar was providing the do you know the way, the Emperor Palpatine, the LOL. As far as shakes go, they had the Tide Pod shake, the PBJ time, the Nihan, the scumbag shake, and the forever alone. So the meme restaurant was asking for $350,000 from Kickstarter and they got six. The Gamer Archive. So this was a Kickstarter campaign for a game console that was supposed to be able to play every video game ever. Honestly, to me, it doesn't really look like this Kickstarter came from a place of malice. It looks like it more came from a place of not understanding that there's pretty much no way to make a game console that'll have every video game ever licensed for it. They asked for $26.5 million to make this happen, and they got six. Echo Caves. So this is an app that seems to be loosely based off of something from the show Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time is this like live action show with a bunch of different characters who have shown up in different Disney properties over the years. I've never actually watched the show, but apparently in season three of the show, there's a scene where these characters need to save this other character from this cave. It's this magical cave thing. It's called Echo Cave in the show, I think. And the only way for these characters to save their friends friend from this cave is to admit their deepest, darkest secret. Once they admit their secret, this bridge shows up and they can save the character. I don't know. I've never watched the show. Anyway, it looks like this app is supposed to be kind of loosely based on this concept from the show. So based on what this Kickstarter says, the way this game would work is you first sign up and make an account with Echo Caves, and then you send a link to someone to join your game. And once two people have paired up for a game, uh, these two people will play a quick game of rock, paper, 
scissors. And the winner of the rock, paper, scissors game will basically have full remote access to the loser's phone. From the looks of this Kickstarter, it looks like the winner is supposed to be able to view the loser's phone screen. They're supposed to be able to listen through their mic, inspect their browser history or call history. Another kind of interesting thing about this app is from the looks of this Kickstarter, uh, this game was supposed to have like paid tiers you could get and paying for a tier for this app would give you extra abilities that your opponent wouldn't have. Like for example, the Kickstarter mentions that if you pay for a regular and a premium account, you'd get cheating capabilities where you could cheat in the rock, paper, scissors game. Some other abilities you could pay for include hiding the screen, protecting the mic, protecting the camera, protecting the SMS inbox, protecting the SMS outbox, and protecting the browsing history. This is basically just an app where you play rock, paper, scissors, and the loser gets spyware on their phone. Uh, this campaign asks for $27,000 and they got zero. I'm also a little bit disappointed this thing didn't come to fruition. I'd love to hear like sob stories of people getting wrecked by echo caves. Yap attack. Uh, so this app was made for people who never learned how to use their words. Is there anything worse than rude cell phone behavior? Ooh. I don't think so. Like this guy in the elevator. Yeah. Now fight back with yap attack. Remember this guy in the yeah, elevator? I believe how well they're doing. Yeah, I don't know that. He'll be taking the stairs. Yeah, so basically the idea behind this app is if someone is obnoxiously talking on their phone in public, uh, you're supposed to whip out the Yap Attack app and start like spamming sound effects in their face to make them shut up. Could you imagine getting an important phone call and someone walks up to you and starts spamming like bagpipe sound effect number three in your face? It's it's basically just like a meme soundboard. The developers of Yap Attack wanted $15,000 to make their app a reality, but they only managed to get four hundred. The Zen Egg. So the Zen Egg is a wooden egg, and that's about it. The only thing that might make this thing a little bit special is it stands up on its own. And, you know, despite this thing being literally a wooden egg, this Kickstarter campaign hams this thing up to be like a handcrafted meditation tool or whatever. In that way, this Kickstarter campaign is kind of a similar situation to the clipboard thing from earlier. Now, here's the thing about this Kickstarter campaign. They asked for $2,200 to make the Zen Egg a reality and they got over $100,000. In fact, you can go onto their website right now and buy one of these things for like 55 bucks. So I guess maybe this thing shouldn't be considered a Kickstarter failure because they got funded and they made the thing, but still, I think this belongs on the iceberg. Mokays. So what's Mokays, you might be wondering? Take a look at this. Mokays, your mobile makes even coffee now. So yeah, Mocase is supposed to be a phone case that supplies coffee. Now, we're using the word supply here, not make. It doesn't make coffee. If you read through the Kickstarter, the way this thing was supposed to work is they were gonna sell like little carts that had pre-made espresso in them, and then you'd put them into your like phone case, um, and then when you wanted to drink the espresso, all the phone case would do is heat it up and let you pour it out. And it doesn't really even make a lot. It just makes like a single shot of espresso. So the Mocase was asking for a little over $80,000 to make the Mocase a reality, but they only ended up getting a little over 4,500 before it looks like Kickstarter decided to suspend this campaign. Looking through this campaign, I'm not really entirely sure why they decided to suspend this thing. Like, oh, it's not a great idea, sure, but like, I'm not exactly sure uh, where this campaign would be breaking the terms of service. This campaign does feature a prototype video. In this video, for some reason, they're panning the camera around a lot. I don't really know what the deal with that is, but it looks like they have a working prototype, I think. Maybe they were suspicious of this video. I don't know. Interestingly, on the comments section of this Kickstarter page, the creator of this Kickstarter says that they purposely took down this campaign. But, you know, that's not what the little message thing says. It says that it was suspended by Kickstarter. I don't know who to believe here. Also, after the Kickstarter went down, they said that they were going to sell it on their website anyway, but they never did. September 11th Redux. So, uh, just a little context. 
and has become the subject of quite a few different conspiracy theories over the years. Uh, out of all the different conspiracy theories about this thing, uh, there's kind of like a genre of conspiracy theories that don't believe the planes actually hit the towers. You know, floating around the internet, you can find conspiracy theories about there being missiles or holograms or lasers. You know, there really are countless conspiracy theories out there. Uh, with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at what this Indiegogo campaign was pitching. Thanks for visiting Redux. My name is Paul Salo. I've lived in Asia since 1989 and started several businesses over the years in Japan and China. Many people want to know more about Nine. We are like a Mythbusters for It's an important project for many reasons. Many people doubt various details of as the world has changed, our trust in government and media has declined significantly. We want to see ourselves. We don't need people to guide our thinking. In this project, we will recreate the best of our ability, given the funds raised. Our ultimate goal is a fully loaded 767 and a similar structure to the World Trade Center. We will crash the fully loaded with fuel plane, complete with black box, into the building using autopilot at 500 miles per hour. You will be able to see for yourself what happens under these extreme circumstances. I'm not sure which country we will purchase the aircraft and building, but it doesn't really matter much. I'm a globetrotter and we will go where we need to go to complete this important project. You can be part of this. How will it end up? Will the plane disintegrate? Will the black box disappear? Will the out of date passports we scatter in the plane survive? You will see it all. We aren't trying to prove anything either way. We will recreate the event and let the chips fall where they may. $5,000 gets you a front row seat at the event. A full recording of the event. We will have top notch cinematographers to document each step in the process. No hanky panky. Streaming videos from the plane. The building and full inspections before and after. This streaming video from the plane? You will see it all and meet like-minded folk. An epic event, however it turns out. We need about 1.5 million to purchase the plane and building and to pull this complex event off. The fuel alone is over 100,000. I'll document everything on Redux.com and you will be on our newsletter and have full access to our weekly webinar updates. You can be part of this. If you have ever wondered how, why, or if, you don't need to anymore. We're going to do this and you'll be a big part. If we don't reach our 1.5 million, we will purchase a smaller plane and building. Either way, we are going to learn a heck of a lot. But from the interest we have so far, I think we will reach and surpass our goal. So after this Indiegogo campaign launched, quite a few different news outlets picked up on this thing. As you might imagine, most of them did not like this. The uh, guy behind this campaign, a guy by the name of Paul Salo, ended up posting a video on his YouTube channel where he kind of further elaborates on this thing. If you are a denier, or I shouldn't use the word denier. If you doubt anything about we want to blast this to smithereens or we want to prove you completely right. It looks like this campaign didn't manage to raise a lot of money before it got taken down by Indiegogo. After this Indiegogo campaign closed, it looked like Paul Salo was still trying a little bit to make this thing still work, but it looks like he never managed to get the funding he needed. And so he kind of threw away the idea. This Paul Salo guy, he's an interesting character. You know, there's a million issues something like this would have, obviously. Uh, some people have pointed out, people that seem to know what they're talking about pretty well. If the recreation wasn't one-to-one, -one, the whole thing would kind of be pointless. You know, if this project wasn't a perfect one-to-one -one recreation of the circumstances, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of valuable information gathered, and an actual one-to-one -one recreation is going to cost probably a lot more than 1.5 million. And another problem to consider with this campaign is the whole point of this campaign is to either dispel or confirm conspiracy theories, right? Well, when it comes to people that believe in conspiracy theories, many of them will believe or argue that none of the video footage is supposed to be believed because, I don't know, for example, it's been tampered with by the government, right? And so considering that, you know, if they managed to actually do this thing and videos of this managed to start circulating the internet, who's to say that these videos aren't being tampered with by the government as well? Who's to say the government wasn't in on the Indiegogo campaign? In the same way, not could have totally just been a psyop from the eyes of a conspiracy theorist. 
I mean, what's stopping this thing from being a PSYOP as well? Chronicles of Illyria. I just kind of felt like talking about this one last. So in July of 2016, a Kickstarter was launched by a new startup company by the name of Soulbound Studios. Soulbound Studios CEO was a man by the name of Jeremy Walsh. And this Kickstarter campaign was for a game that they were calling Chronicles of Illyria. Now, campaigns for video games show up all the time on Kickstarter, but this game is a little bit different. The pitch for Chronicles of Illyria is is really ambitious. The Kickstarter page describes Chronicles of Illyria as a hyper-detailed online MMORPG. This game was supposed to have a persistent world, so anytime you logged off, the game world would continue to change and evolve even when you're not playing. The game was going to feature a real-time aging system where your character would actually age over the course of 10 to 14 real-world months. And on top of that, the game was supposed to have permadeath, so in some circumstances you could die and just lose everything. The game was to have a fully destructible environment, the game was to have non-repeatable side quests, and you'd even be able to form contracts with other players to put them on quests for you. There was supposed to be a system where you could build towns and marry people, and you could have kids, and the game was gonna have this medieval social hierarchy system where you could become like the lord or the king of a town. There would be no mini-map, you would have to make your own maps, and so you could even make like fake maps and give them to people to sabotage them. There were to be survival mechanics, like you would need food and water, and you'd have to wear warm clothes in cold environments. I could keep talking about all the different features this game was supposed to have, but it just goes on and on. It sounds like almost like a life simulator. The Kickstarter campaign asked for $900,000 from backers, and they actually received $1.3 million. Now, this original Kickstarter campaign estimates that the game will be released in 2017. 2017 was six years ago. So where has this game been? Where did all the money go? What's going on? Well, it's a long and convoluted story that really requires an entire video to break down if you wanna know the full story, but I'll try and just give you a kind of a rundown of the messiness. After this Kickstarter campaign ended, they continued raising funds for this game on their website through selling in-game DLC for Chronicles of Illyria, you know, a game that's not even out yet. Through this, they ended up getting the total funds raised for the game up to 7.9 million. During this time, they continued giving updates on the development of the game, but most of the updates that they provided probably left quite a bit to be desired for most. A lot of these updates cover topics that didn't directly pertain to the development of the game, and I don't think it would be unreasonable for this to bother people. In 2019, they started showing off gameplay of the game that looked like this. Now, to be fair, this is supposed to be just like a low-poly development version of the game. This is not what the graphics of the game were supposed to look like when the game was actually going to come out. This was just like development test graphics, but I'd also imagine imagine that if you were a backer of this campaign and three years after the campaign ended, you were showing me stuff that looked like this, I probably wouldn't be super happy anyway. Also in 2019, they finally released something playable to backers. It used the same development graphics and it was just like a parkour mini game. A lot of people probably weren't super happy about that either. There was also this really confusing thing that happened shortly after this demo released where it looked like the CEO had said that he was going to shut down so Soulbound Studios because they had run out of money until two weeks later where he kind of just completely walked back the statement and said that development of Chronicles of Illyria would indeed continue with help from people who were essentially volunteer developers. It looks like this debacle kind of left a bad taste in some people's mouth. It looks like some people online speculate that the reason the CEO decided not to shut down the company was because he realized it would leave him vulnerable to a lawsuit or something. That is just speculation. These shenanigans went down in 2020 and it's 2023 and they're still working on the game. Well, kind of. Recently, they've pivoted to developing a different game called Kingdoms of Illyria. It's supposed to be this like top-down city management game. And the reason they're working on this now is because they think they can get it done quicker than they would with Chronicles of Illyria. They also think that they can fulfill some backers rewards through this game. And also all of the things that they're designing for Kingdoms of Illyria will eventually find their way into to Chronicles of Illyria anyway. And so this Kingdoms of Illyria game is supposed to kind of be a stepping stone to Chronicles of Illyria. There is so much more you could talk about when it comes to the development of this game. It's been a mess. I've been keeping up with this game for a little bit now. And if you asked me, I'd kind of say the failure of this game so far ultimately kind of comes down to 
This game is probably too ambitious for its own good. Eight million dollars is probably not enough money to make something like Chronicles of Illyria a reality. It also kind of looks like the CEO of this company probably bit off a little more than he could chew and didn't plan ahead particularly well. Will Chronicles of Illyria actually ever come out? Who knows? And even if it does come out, who knows if it will look anything like what the original Kickstarter pitched. Who knows though, maybe Soulbound Studios will have a comeback. And that was the Kickstarter iceberg. There were some scams, there were some failures, and there were certainly some shenanigans. If you like what you saw, please subscribe. It really helps the channel out. Link in the description for the official Parallel Pipes Discord server, and check out my second channel. I'm gonna be uploading something pretty interesting there soon. You won't wanna miss it.